Good morning. I think there'll still be a few more people coming in, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it looks like we have a good turnout, which uh, hopefully will ensure a robust Q&A. I've been told to please allow as much time as possible, so as the moderator, I'll try to do that. My name is Mike Blakely. I'm with Nathan Associates, and I'm going to be moderating this morning's panel, Poverty Reduction and Sustainable Development Challenges. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to congratulate Sid Washington on the topic that they've selected on sustainable development and uh, shedding some light on the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. I think in our development community, we have an awareness of the SDGs, but I don't know that you could say that much outside of this room or much outside of Washington. Um, but nonetheless, we have three outstanding panelists here. For those of you that heard the welcome remarks, you'll note that Sid said that they were going to try to get outside of the beltway. Um, unfortunately for our panel, we failed miserably at that. But nonetheless, let me introduce them. To my right is Casey Dunning, Senior Policy Analyst for the Center for Global Development. Next to her is Augusto Lopez Claros, Director of the Global Indicators Group at the World Bank Group. And finally, Ariel Meyerstein, Vice President for Labor Affairs, Corporate Responsibility and Governance for the U.S. Council for International Business. And to be fair, Ariel did say that they have an office in New York, and that's where he's based. So we somewhat achieved it. And as uh, you also heard there, you can download an app and get their bios. And of course, we're in the day and age where there's an app for everything. So I encourage you to visit that. So this morning, we're going to talk about poverty reduction and sustainable development. And I think we start by acknowledging that this is by no means a new topic. Um, in fact, if we look at the predecessor to the Sustainable Development Goals, the Millennium Development Goals, they achieved quite a bit in this nexus of poverty reduction, um, specifically in things like access to drinking water, reducing the child mortality rate, many of the th important things that we work on every day. And so now as we start to actually enter this post-2015 development agenda, here we are with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I like to think most of us as optimists, um, but we have some very real challenges to face and in a very short time frame. And the Sustainable Development Goals provide this platform of 17 goals, 169 targets, 230 plus indicators. And the real question in front of us is how are we gonna do this over the next 15 years? So we all know that it's going to take innovative ideas it's going to take new types of financing for development, and most of all, it's going to take a commitment to international cooperation. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today and hear from our, our panelists on that. So without further ado, I want to jump into the first question. If you've looked at the panel description, you can see that one of the questions that very directly touches this is, what strategies should the development community pursue to accelerate poverty reduction and move the needle on SDG 1. Uh, for those who don't know, SDG 1 is, is no poverty, and that, of course, is no small challenge. Um, but maybe to get started, we could talk a little bit through the lens of your organizations of how you're approaching this idea of no poverty by 2030. Yeah. Casey, you want to start? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Michael, and thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, so coming from a think tank, I'm going to uh, uh, do the, the data lens here. Um, and uh, a key cornerstone of the SDGs um, writ large was this notion to leave no one behind. So the most marginalized, the most vulnerable should also be included in the SDGs because I think the MDGs, one could uh, posit, were kind of more uh, about the low-hanging fruit of development, kind of the socioeconomic ec um, parts of development that you could more easily count and quantify. So for ending extreme poverty, it's going to be about having um, 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 women and ethnic minorities and, and kind of the most um, vulnerable be reached. Now to do that, you need disaggregated data. And if we look at even the indicator data that's available for indicator 1.1.1 and extreme poverty, 72 countries currently lack a single data point for the last 15 years. 
now. 45 of those are high income countries and so perhaps you could um, argue don't actually need to have extreme poverty data. But as you probably all know, the agenda is meant to be a um, universal one, so um, perhaps we can discuss that um, later. So from the CGD perspective, we're looking at what um, data is available, and especially um, for the poverty goal, what is missing in terms of disaggregated um, data for uh, all the, the different um, populations that currently aren't covered, and as um, no surprise, there is highly, uh, there's a paucity of disaggregated um, data for this indicator as well. And so that's the entry uh, point that um, CGD is taking. Thank you. Augusto? Um, I'd like to share with you a little bit uh, um, of the numbers that are put together at the World Bank on poverty. Um, you know, SDG number one specifically refers to a poverty line which is the definition that we use internationally for extreme poverty. And so let me, let me just share with you a little bit about you know, what, what, what are the kinds of numbers that we're coming up with and what has been the evolution of extreme poverty over the last, whatever, 20, 30 years. Um, the first observation that I'd like to make is that um, SDG number one is framed in terms of $1.25 uh, poverty line, but uh, in 2015 the World Bank came up with a new poverty line. This is something that we do every four, five, six years um, because there is a methodology that needs to be updated. There are price indices that need to be brought up to date. And so now the new poverty line is $1.90. Um, and I, my guess is that going forward, we're going to be increasingly referred to the $1.90 poverty line rather than the $1.25, which you actually see in, 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 in documents uh, of the United Nations and so on. And essentially what we do is we take a look at the poverty lines of the 15 poorest countries in the world. We convert these poverty lines to an equivalent basis using a purchasing power uh, parity adjustment and then that becomes, we average those, broadly speaking, and that becomes the poverty line, the new poverty line, which is $1.90. Let me give you just an ex a, 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 a couple of numbers that will show you what has happened over the last, let's say, 25 years since 1990. If you go back to 1990 and, and use a comparable $1.90 poverty line, at that time there were a little under 2 billion extremely poor people a little under two billion, just keep that number in mind. 1990, $1.90 poverty line. Jumped to 2011 or 2012, and the number came down to about 900 million. So this has led to some optimism in the international community. People, people have said, look, remarkable progress has been made in reducing uh, extreme, extreme poverty. Uh, uh, from down from 2 billion to uh, 900 million, that is, that is notable progress. I'd like to add two cautionary footnotes to this number. The first one is that when you actually look at the breakdown of the reduction in extreme poverty by regions of the world, the reduction from 2 billion to 900 million is very much a China story. It's very, very much a China story. Um, I will not go into the details, although if you're interested, I, could, I have the data on the regional breakdown. But basically, China accounts for the lion's share of the reduction in extreme poverty you know, over this 25, let's say 1990 to 2012, 22-year period um, because of very, you know, very high economic growth. In fact, if you look at the data for Africa, which is the other large pocket of extreme poverty back in 1990, there has actually been an increase in the number of extremely poor people from about 288 million people back in 1990 to close to 400 million people uh, in 2012. So you have this kind of shift in the composition of extreme poverty away from, from China uh, into Sub-Saharan Africa. So that is by way of cautioning you not to be too 
you know, not to not to be uh, sort of a too too in, in too much of a celebratory mood about you know the progress made in the last 20, 22 years in terms of the reduction of extreme poverty. I mean, some people will say, ah, yes, but of course, a Chinese citizen who's poor is this exactly the same as a, a African citizen who's poor, and. You know, I have some sympathy for that argument, but but there has been a shift in the in the location of poverty, you know, to, to, to Africa in a very tangible way. The other observation which I'd like to make, which I think is very, very important as well, is that <coughs> the data shows there are a whole bunch of people just above the extreme poverty line. Um, in fact, if you were to use instead of dollar ninety something like a $3 poverty line. Uh, in fact, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people get actually de redefined as, as extremely poor. Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, something to keep in mind for the following reason, that when you ask yourself, what does a dollar ninety actually mean in practice? Right? You know, what, how does a person living on a dollar ninety per day actually live? Um, and once you begin to look at the data, and once you begin to ask all the pertinent questions, it is a very, very austere uh, poverty line. You know, if you are earning a dollar ninety and uh, uh, it's a family with a few children and the husband loses his job, that family goes immediately into into hungry mode. He, he has no income. There is no social security or uh, you know safety uh, safety nets to protect them you know from adverse shocks. It, it's really a very, very difficult life. And so there are many people who argue that, in fact, if you were to use a definition of poverty that was not so austere, the 900 million numbers that we're working now you know, would actually increase in a, in a big way. And, and I thought that I would just, I do, I would just make that, that, uh, that, that comment now. So um, to summarize, we have 900 million people now um, are using the $1.90 poverty line, and there is some kind of optimism that by 2030, perhaps even well before 2030, you know, we could have reduced this number, you know, significantly with the qualifications that I, that I have added. I think I will stop here. Yeah, okay. Good. Ariel? Hi, thank you. Well, thanks so much to, to Sid and uh, to Michael for involving me today. I'm really humbled to be here with uh, such learned experts. Um, in terms of goal one, I actually would like to step back from that and, and think about what, it, what goal one is, which I really think it's kind of like the uber goal. You know, it is the goal, right? Um, and yet it's its own goal. But at the same time, it's really... Uh, an effect of other goals, and there's, and this, this is kind of the the beauty and also the madness of of the SDGs, which is that they're so interrelated, and there's so many overlaps and interconnections between the different goals and targets. So if you look at goal one, ending poverty, well, as as um, Augusta was just saying, you know, it's a very austere look at what it means um, to talk about uh, poverty. Obviously, in goal one, there is also a mention of um, social protection, which is a whole other conversation. Um, from the business community's perspective, the way to get there, at least partially there, um, is through jobs and economic growth um, and investment. And so you can look to goal eight, for example, which talks about um, inclusive economic growth, decent work, so that more people have jobs. Because as Augusto was just saying, uh, if someone has a job and they lose the job and there's no social protection, so social safety net, then boom, they're right in, um, in a very extreme form of poverty. Um, and when you look at, unfortunately, when you look at the jobs issue, as everyone knows, we're also not in a great, great shape globally, um, particularly among youth. Um, but also, from a statistics and an indicator's perspective, also not in good shape. So there, there are a lot of people in the world that have jobs, but we just don't have a good count for them. And that's, those are people in the informal economy. And those are the people that are most likely um, possibly teetering uh, on the verge of poverty. There are some people who are probably doing thriving in the um, informal economy, but they're probably um, the, the minority. And the numbers that we have on the informal economy globally, I think the best measures are from the International Labor Organization, and their statistics only cover 60 or so countries at the moment. And obviously, the informal economy is something that's very hard to measure to begin with. Um, and that relates to another aspect of this, which is just having better 
uh, data generally. So in terms of your question, in terms of how do we get there, um, I really do like to emphasize this, this issue of um, enabling our ability to measure um, and get, getting better data, which will tie in and reinforce um, all, of the, all of the efforts um, collectively. We'll know how many more people are in the informal economy or how many people don't have jobs at all. We'll know how many people don't have any social protection. Governments will have better data to extend social protection to others. Um, and so you need to kind of look at all the goals together to even begin, I think, talking about goal one, which doesn't really mean anything um, without the other one. So I'll, I'll stop there, I think, for now. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, measurement is one of the main issues and concerns. And even though that was much later on my list of questions, I think all three panelists brought that up right away as one of the issues. In fact, Casey, uh, just last week you published a blog post, SDG indicators, serious gaps abound in data availability. And you also suggested in that blog post that uh, the decision not to consider data availability during goal and target selection may come back to haunt SDG implementation. So I'm going to start with you um, and then to the other panelists if they want to comment even further on the measurement issue, although I'm confident we're going to have a question from the audience on that again later. Sure. And I was using polite language there in that <laughs> blog post. Um, I, not to be too cynical here, but we are currently 144 days into implementation of the SDGs, and less than one quarter of all of the 230 individual indicators we currently have data for. 25% of them we currently have data for. And that's what's publicly available. Um, and so my concern is, twofold, like one on measuring progress. So if, if um, I did some analysis looking at the indicators by goal, and I'm going to get a little bit um, wonky here, so um, forgive me, but the UN has classified all the indicators as um, tier one, which means there's um, a methodology and um, currently produced um, data as tier two, which means there's an established methodology, but no um, data that's currently available, and tier three with no methodology. So 97 indicators are tier one right now, but if you look at what's actually publicly available of those tier one indicators, only 62% of the tier ones are actually available for um, groups like yours to um, note and help uh, um, countries um, measure progress on. And this is a problem for a host of reasons, but one that I'll point out is that if we look at the SDGs, they're meant to be this holistic, integrated agenda. However, if you look at the availability of data, there are serious gaps by goal, and it's mostly on kind of the new goal areas. So goals one through six, which one could argue are, are hangovers um, um, from the MDGs, we have a pretty good track record on. The goals seven through 16 starts to get a little bit um, dicey. And if you don't have the data to actually uh, measure these new issue areas, I um, fear that it will uh, largely turn to kind of more rhetorical um, um, flourishes as opposed to actual implementation. And if you look at the l number of tier one indicators, goal 13 on, on climate action has zero tier one indicators. Goal 14 on life underwater has zero indicators that are actually publicly available. And so if, if this is the base from which we're starting, I am highly concerned that implementation for countries that are struggling to even implement one or two goals and know the indicators on which they should be reporting, if we have no um, data, then it's kind of a catch um, 22 of how we'll actually implement these goals, but I'm sure my colleagues will have thoughts as well. Well, I know, Augusto, you work in data collection every day. I mean, where, what do you have to add to this? Uh, well, first of all, I'm very sympathetic with the concerns expressed by Casey. Um, let, let, me, let me sort of step back a little bit and, and uh, uh, sort of celebrate, in, in some sense, something that has been done with the SDGs uh, building on the MDGs, and that has created the kinds of problems that, that Casey is referring to. And, 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 and by way of an example, I will pick up on SDG number three on, on health, right? 
SDG number three on health says, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all um, at all ages. And this already embodies this principle, right, of inclusiveness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that we are going to uh, have these goals uh, being as comprehensive as possible, and we're going to try to not leave out particular groups of people, you know, whether it be uh, children, whether it be in informal workers, whether it be migrants, and, and so on, which itself creates a huge data problem because, in fact, we don't have the aggregated data, which is a point that Casey made at the, at the very beginning, right? But let's look a little bit more specifically at, at what has happened to the health um, targets. Um, the SDG on health basically has retained some of the elements that were present in the MDGs, maternal mortality, infant mortality, uh, for instance, the, the whole question of uh, infectious diseases are still embodied in the SDG, which is fine, fine, because there is still progress to be made in these areas. However, the SDG on health goes well beyond what we were doing on health in the MDGs. And this is good. This is good. You know, th we should have some progress. We should be more ambitious in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve over the longer term. To give you a, an, a, 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 a couple of examples of the kinds of things which are now being part of the SDG on health, we have non-communicable diseases, for instance, as, as a target. We have targets on mental health. We have targets on substance abuse, on, on injuries. Uh, in other words, the SDG on health is, is what you could characterize as a very broad embrace that even refers to things like contamination from hazardous substances and so on. Now, I don't want to say the downside, because downside implies sort of negative, I want to say the challenge. The challenge associated with this broad embrace is that, in fact, we don't have the data for it. And to illustrate, <coughs> let's talk a little bit about promoting mental health and well-being. How do you, how do you capture that? You know? Promote mental health and well-being. Um, well, we know that health is a component of well-being, for sure. And we have lots of good data on health. But uh, does anybody in the audience think that health on the one hand and well-being on the other are totally synonymous? No, I don't think so. I think health is a dimension of well-being. Well-being, which we're in the business of promoting under the SDG framework, is actually a much broader concept. It may involve a spiritual dimension. It may have something to do with life satisfaction. It may have something to do with, uh, with uh, um, you know, just a broader, a broader concept which captures many other things beyond, beyond health. So I'm happy that we're trying to do this, but it does mean that um, we're going to have some serious, serious data challenges because many of these things we don't have the data for. And even if we had the funding, they are going to be sort of important challenges for us to actually generate the indicators and the data to track them. Okay. Later on, if, the, uh, if Michael gives me the opportunity, one of the things I'd like to share with you um, is something that refers specifically to it in SDG number one, which is basically the creation of appropriate policy frameworks, right, to help us get in, in, in to, to help us make progress in the direction of reducing poverty, which is what SDG number one is all about. But I'll, I'll hold on those remarks and I will, I will come back to, uh, in a little while. Well, so we know that the data collection issue is one of the more practical challenges that the SDGs face. Um, but I want to actually step back a little bit and ask about the whole idea of um, a major ambitious international initiative like the SDGs. It, it requires so much from so many different entities. Are we in an environment today or in the next five years where something like the SDGs can be this platform that everybody buys into as our tool of poverty reduction and sustainable development? or? Are we going to be facing challenges with international collaboration and cooperation? Because this is the question you don't see asked as often. People are so eager to drill into where they find a problem and which indicator, et cetera, et cetera. But I think sometimes you have to step back and say, this is one of three major initiatives from last year. Uh, it's one of many over the last decade. So from the prospect of a major international initiative taking us to no poverty, what do you think about the prospects there? Well, Ariel, let's start with you. Um, I think it's an excellent question. 
And in both what Casey and Augusta were pointing out, you know, the ambiguity of some of the goals, I mean, th we have to recognize what it is. It is a political project by the global community to dream a better sense of itself for the future. We have to be very honest about what it is. And it was a lot of cooks in the kitchen, um, and that's why you have 17 goals and 169 targets, and as we've said, you know, indicators still in development. You know, if you were, if it was, if it was one rational planner who was, you know, someone told some bureaucrat somewhere, no offense to any bureaucrats in the room, go come up with these goals, they may have said, okay, well, what are your main objectives? What do we currently have data on? Where are the gaps? Okay, let's set some measurable benchmarks we might achieve. That was not this process as all, at all. I mean, there were attempts at that at the beginning, I think, but it was, you know, quickly lost in political discussions and things like that. So we have to just recognize the, the beast for what it is and say, okay. Now, there's a benefit to that, which is that it's inspiring. Now, 17 is not, <laughs> it's very hard, you know, a lot of business people would say, that's way too many bullet points. Um, we can't capture all of that. But on the other hand, because it's 17 and it's universal, there's something in it for everyone. So from the business community's perspective, it should be seen as a kind of, you know, buffet of opportunity to be involved and show your contribution um, to humanity and your involvement in this collective endeavor. So there's a, there's a positive um, in that as well. In terms of your, you know, your specific question about, well, what's gonna happen, I think, you know, it's, it, the, real, the, the real problem is that the SDGs are a new framework, it's a new language, but they didn't address any of the underlying political realities or architectural um, embeddedness in the, in the global system. So how well does the World Bank and the UN, various agencies, how well do they currently um, get along? The SDGs have been an opportunity, I think, and financing for development to improve that relationship a bit, where the World Bank gets to come and present to UN agencies and member states, which I don't think always happens. So that's, that's a positive. The SDGs aren't gonna fix that by themselves, and of course within each UN agency, they're all gonna see their own agenda and wanna own different goals. UNEP's gonna want certain goals, um, UN Development Program's gonna want certain goals, Food and Agriculture Organization, ILO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But of course they all, over, they all over, overlap and interrelate. So how do you then work that out um, operationally? So I think that it's, it's a powerful new language to speak in and business is trying to begin to, to speak that language but you're, it's not gonna fix everything by itself. And so we have to kind of remember what it is. We can all kind of strive in that general direction together, but um, I think they're gonna, you're gonna see from an implementation standpoint, a lot of, and I'm, so, I'm not being cynical, I think it's the reality, a lot of still kind of infighting and competition over resources and misalignment and redundancy and um, a big pet peeve of ours, which is poor coordination with the private sector, and I, I'm happy to go into that a little bit more um, later. And Augusto, do you want to respond? Um, I guess beyond the, the SDG framework and, and the kinds of targets and, and indicators that we need to develop, um, I think we need to be giving some thought as to the kind of sort of policy framework that we need to put in place in, 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 you know, in, 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 in the world, really, that independently of measurement issues will actually allow us to make substantial progress you know, with respect to the, to, to the SDGs. And I think I'd like to basically share with you for, for a few minutes some of the thinking that we are, that we are playing around with at, at the World Bank. Um, because obviously this is one area that for us is of keen interest. You know, we have a policy dialogue with all our member countries. Um, it may be of interest to you, and this is a relatively noticed recent development at the World Bank, that this policy dialogue, which overwhelmingly in the past decades used to be you know, with developing countries, now takes place even with high income countries. Um, Michael knows because I sent him an email yesterday. I was in Rome uh, last week and I had a meeting with the Minister of Justice because we have a project in my department called the Doing Business uh, Project in which the Italian government is keenly interested. And so, um, uh, but, but, but I, I, 
So I mentioned that in passing, that you know, this policy dialogue uh, which the World Bank has, you know, is basically has, has, has broadened and is very much focused on the question, you know, what are the kinds of policies that we want to encourage in the world that would actually allow us to make progress with respect to the many, many of the SDGs, right? And let me give you sort of two or three examples quickly that address specifically the issue of poverty, which is the subject of this, of this panel, right? Um, inevitably, I do have to share some numbers with you, but hopefully I won't put you to sleep, right? Number one, example number one. <clears throat> do you know that every year in the world today we spend $1.9 trillion uh, subsidizing energy consumption? Uh, gasoline, natural gas, electricity, coal, it is a widespread practice throughout the world. It is equivalent to about 2.5% of global GNP. It accounts on average to something like 8% of government revenue. This is at a time when we have great numbers of very poor people. Now, why are these subsidies very little? Why are they a, an example of extremely poor policy? Not the kind of sound policy frameworks which, which are referred to in SDG number one under one, are one, under one of the targets. Well, for instance, let me tell you about energy subsidies. 60% of the benefits go to the top 20% of the highest income part of the distribution. In other words, these, uh, these subsidies are highly regressive. They make Gini coefficients worse. They actually worsen income distribution, which as you know, is already a very se serious problem in the world. And other SDG targets refer specifically to more e the need for more equity. Uh, they actually contribute to climate change because gasoline is so cheap in many of these countries, you know, that people tend to drive more and consume more than would otherwise be the case. So here is an example, you know, of a policy that in many countries coexists with huge numbers of, for instance, illiterates. You know, in the world today, we have 800 million people who can't read and write, people who don't have access to the most basic tools that are actually necessary for you to be able to, you know, grow out of poverty. Uh, and at the same time, governments, uh, I won't give you the name, but we have one government, we have the data. We have one government uh, in a somewhat distant location from Washington, D.C., that spends every year $48 billion out of its budget to subsidize the driving habits of its middle class. Right? And this is a country that has a large pocket of, of illiterates in the, in, in the world today, two-thirds of them women. So the elimination of some of, these, some of these subsidies and moving to a world in which we price energy in a, in a more rational way would have a very, very clear impact on, on, on poverty reduction. Because, to give you an example, if you divide $1.9 trillion by 800 million people, that gives you $2,300 per person per year. And I ask you, do you think that $2,300 is enough to teach one person to read and write in over a one-year period? It is an embarrassment of riches, actually. It's much more. With $2,300 in some African countries, we could, we could teach a whole school full of children you know, to read and write. And, and yet the, these funds are available on an annual basis. It's, one, it's not 1.9 trillion every 10 years. It is every year, right? So, so this is one example. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, or uh, let's say one more and then I'll come back if we have time. At the World Bank, we have a very interesting project which is, which is basically delivering all kinds of very interesting insights on the economic costs of gender inequality. Um, this project is called Women, Business, and the Law, and what we do is we look at, the, at, at all the legal instruments in a country, the Constitution, the Civil Code, Family Law, uh, and we try to discover in which ways governments are using the law to undermine women in some way, you know, to limit her property rights, to limit her access to, to, to jobs. I was in Moscow in April, and I had a meeting with Mr. Shubalov, who's the deputy prime minister in charge of economic policy. And at one point, he turns to me and he says, and what else can we do in Russia to improve the quality of the business environment? And I told him, you know, I thought, I was prepared actually for that. So he walked into the trap, he didn't realize it. But <laughs> I said, Mr. Shubalov, how about eliminating the 456 job restrictions which women face in your country? Do you know that in Russia, we have this data. There are 456 jobs which women cannot have. They cannot do this, they cannot drive the metro, they cannot drive a truck they, uh, in agriculture, and, and so on. We have the full list. And he was shocked. 
But basically, what we're discovering, uh, as we have built up this data set for 189 countries, is to give you a couple of examples. The higher the number of restrictions embedded in the law against women, the lower the labor force participation rate for women. Okay, so you already think about poverty reduction, right? The higher the number of restrictions, the, lar the lower the number of women-owned businesses. The higher the number of restrictions, the lower the ratio of uh, the, the school enrollment rate for secondary school of, gir of girls relative to boys. Right? So that these, these restrictions actually have a very intimidating impact on girls that they don't go to school to the same, same extent that, that boys. The higher the number of restrictions, the larger the wage gap between men and women. The higher the number of restrictions, the less access to finance which women have in these countries with lots of restrictions, and so on. I could give you many more examples, right? So it is clear, it is clear that if you want to tackle poverty reduction in an effective way over the next 15 years, we need to do a great deal more to remove these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of restrictions which countries have imposed through their legislation on half of the world's population. So this is a, a second example. I have a few more, but I have, I have already spoken. So <laughs> you have many, and, and we have a big audience, and it was going to have a lot of questions, too. But you did answer one of the other questions, which was this issue as if, if you look at the targets, uh, especially those of us who work on the ground, you can see a great opportunity for those to be an influence on, rate, on, on change, policy change, regulatory change. I think I wanted to pick up on something Ariel said about jobs, because the private sector is trying to find their way with, with the SDGs uh, and, you know, poverty reduction maybe more broadly. Um, one of the biggest possible changes could be in business enabling environment. Uh, Ariel, w can you talk a little bit about your membership and what they're doing? Are the SDGs an opportunity to keep pushing that, or is it just another issue out there to link to? Well, I mean, I think uh, they, they are an opportunity from the standpoint that um, fortunately Goal 16 exists and it does talk about good governance and rule of law and transparency and accountability and fighting corruption, um, all the things that uh, the World Bank tracks in various ways. Um, I'm so glad Augusta mentioned the amazing research that they do on that. We actually hosted someone from that unit at an event last uh, February in New York because it is so clear and the research is so powerful on that front, and that is part of that conversation. I mean, governance has to do with accountable institutions, and when half of your population is excluded from, particip from participation, whether it's political or economic, then you don't have accountable institutions. Um, so from that standpoint, yes, it's another opportunity to push that agenda, but I mean, I think that's an agenda worth pushing. Um, and if it inspires people to make those connections, you know, what is the connection between good governance and informality? What is the good, and, and provision of public services and the extension of a social, um, social safety net? What is the connection between women's empowerment and good governance, um, between other forms of inequality, between basic economic growth? Um, how do you set up the right enabling environments for businesses to just set up shop, which is what the doing business indicators uh, measure? and everywhere you look, and the question of informality is about that fundamentally. The reason often that people are in the informal sector, either they're born into it, or they look at the cost-benefit analysis and they say, I'm gonna become formal, I'm gonna pay taxes into the system, but the government is not gonna deliver on the flip side, so why should I do that? I'm gonna make more or keep more by remaining informal. And that's a problem because then that means the government has fewer resources to extend to the rest of the society, to extend social safety nets. So it's in some ways really, really, really important, and it's great um, which, that it, Goal 16 is there and that it does cover that, because it wasn't necessarily gonna be in there. It was one of the ones that certain countries were not in favor of, of including. Um, so in this political project, it's good that it's part of the conversation. Well, goal number 16 is also where you find a reference to um ending corruption. And um, Augusto, you've written a lot about the link of corruption and sustainable development. Do you want to talk a little bit about, do you think that, that the fact that this is now an SDG target, is that going to help the argument at all, the, the fight against corruption? Or is this, again, a lot of people in the room are on the ground every day and seeing this in the implementation of our work. It, did, did the, let me ask you this way, is there, did we miss an opportunity here to maybe have more than one target at corruption, or is that all we could, you know, were we limited 
that all we could get in there and we should be happy with that. You also have to look at the indicators yeah. that are going to be yeah. measuring, which, you know, one of them, I don't know if there are more, I'm sorry to preempt this, but mm -hmm. I think one of them currently proposes the number of people who have contact with a government official. Mm -hmm. And then it says, and who pay, pay a bribe, which if you think about it in your head, how are you going to capture that mm -hmm. data and track yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and that's just one challenge, I think. Yeah. Actually, um, Ariel mentioned what we're doing at the World Bank um, on the, on the um, sort of doing business project, which is essentially about you know, helping countries create a, a policy framework that encourages entrepreneurship and encour encourages the development of the, of the, of the private sector. And I, I want to um, mention a very interesting finding that we have made um, that pertains to the subject of corruption uh, in, the, in the Doing Business project. You know, we have in, the, in, in Doing Business a, a whole range of indicators that capture different dimensions of the quality of the business environment. And the progress that has been made over the last 10 years is very, very encouraging, actually. Um, just to give you an example, if you go back to 2005 and you ask yourself, in how many countries in the world did it take less than 20 days to get a business started, a small business, a limited liability company? It turns out that back then it was 41 countries, and they were mainly OECD, rich OECD countries. So it took less than 20 days, you know, in whatever, in the Netherlands, New Zealand, and a few of countries, you know, in various corners of the developing world. If you ask the same question today in 2015, not 16 because the data hasn't come out yet, but let's say for last year's report, the number is 132. In other words, there has been a tripling of the number of countries where it takes less than 20 days to get a business started. Now. Why is this important and what does it have to do with your question on corruption? It is tremendously important because we have discovered that in those countries where it is hellish to get a business started, where the procedural obstacles and the bureaucracy is very burdensome, then what Ariel described is exactly what happens, that people will decide, well, no, uh, doing this according to the letter of the law is very complicated and very costly, therefore I will go underground, right? Well, what we have discovered that in those countries where it is very, very complicated to, to do business or to pay your taxes or to enforce a contract or to hire a worker and so on, levels of corruption are, are much higher. In fact, <clears throat> we don't have a PowerPoint here, but this is a very easy chart to imagine. On one axis, you have the doing business scores for countries where a higher score means um, better performance. And on the other axis, you have the corruption perceptions index indicators. And they are nicely distributed along a 45 degree line. In other words, those countries that have better procedures, less complicated uh, uh, regulation, more sensible regulation, are countries that tend to have lower levels of corruption and vice versa, right? And so, um, that, that's the, the, sort of the first observation. The second observation is, is, has to do with the fact that there are all kinds of very interesting, fascinating interlinkages between the, be, between the SDGs, right? And I think that as we move and make progress on some of them, you know, we are going to be indirectly tackling the issue of, of corruption, perhaps not in a kind of a very direct, overt, overt way, but, but implicitly. And this is, this, is, this is progress too, you know? We, 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 have to, we, have to, we have to recognize it. Um, anything that we do that helps to create a more friendly environment for the private sector and for the business community uh, through the kinds of things that we're doing in the Doing Business Project is uh, uh, ultimately going to have an impact on reducing the opportunities for, for corruption. This is a very, very central subject of development for sure, and there's a great deal that needs to be done, but, uh, but, but you know, Creating a sound policy framework as called for in SDG number one is obviously a very important dimension of that, of that battle. Yeah, good. Um, I know we want to move to some audience questions really quick, so I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to direct it to, to Casey. Um, two months from now, we're going to have a meeting of the uh, high-level political forum on sustainable development. What's the narrative going to be? Sure. So, uh, <laughs> um, Right now, 22, I think, um, um, countries have <coughs> volunteered to submit themselves for a review of national implementation. And I think it's gonna be really fascinating to see what comes out of this. It's a mix of high income, middle income, and low income. And these countries have 
um, volunteered to take the 169 targets and um, apply them and see what happens. I think two things will come out of this. One, we will um, realize that even though it is a universal agenda, there are specific goals and, and targets that are will be the focus of high income and specific goals and targets that will be the focus of low income and obviously middle income in between. I also think, and, and you mentioned this earlier, and I wanted to, to quickly hit on this, the SDGs were the what, but in July um, there was a summit in Addis on the how and, and mainly how we're gonna pay for this thing. And so I wanted to quickly hit on the funding because I think it gets to the national implementation question. If you look at current streams of funding right now for development, by and large, the biggest source is uh, our um, domestic resources. And here I'm talking about um, public resources. So um, tax revenues, customs, et cetera. And it's a significant order of magnitude. It's 300 times higher than ODA. So we have to start thinking about how how governments are even thinking about the SDGs because another wrinkle in this is that when the SDGs were agreed upon last September, it was UN envoys who were at the table making these negotiations. <clears throat> and so the level of knowledge of the SDGs themselves, much less how they are to be implemented between a UN envoy and, and a leader or policymaker in the capital, I think it's not a one-to-one -one, um, by any stretch of the imagination. So I think, one, we have to look at how the the capitals are um, thinking about the SDGs, and here there's a lot of work to be done in, in kind of socializing the agenda. And two, thinking about how we use um, um, domestic resources to help and fund this agenda, because it's not coming from ODA, and indeed the second largest um, source for development is um, domestic private um, um, finance, and that um, includes obviously the private sector and brings in whole new issues of how you um, have the local private sector, not um, just um, the big international companies involved in, in development. And so I think kind of connecting national implementation and how it's actually happening um, whether pushed by the UN or the bank um, with how this whole thing is going to be um, funded I, is in my mind kind of the big question right now and unfortunately I don't have a good answer for no, you. Well, we've, I mean we've seen estimates 3.5 to right. 7 it's, trillion it's dollars exactly. it's mind-boggling but uh, anyway uh, I'm sure all of you have questions we can dive into this issue very deeply but uh, let's open it up to everybody here there's a person roving around with a microphone and please, uh, if you don't mind giving your name and your organization. Um, thank you, Mike. I'm from the same organization as Mike. It's called Nathan Associates. Uh, I wanted to thank the panel for the very interesting and informative conversation about SDGs. And I have what might be sort of a wonkish question, but as a PFM practitioner, PFM reform practitioner for over 20 years in many countries, and one of the challenges I've seen in a lot of ministries is properly aligning their plans with their resources or their, perhaps their MTEF, the medium term expenditure framework or what they're gonna be spending over the course of three or five years. So my question for you is, how do you, how do you deal with the low capacity in a lot of governments to figure out how much it's gonna to cost to achieve an indicator, how much it's gonna to cost to achieve an output, and more complicated, how much it's gonna to cost to achieve an outcome. Um, because if we're talking about what, how well or not so well the MDGs were achieved or implemented and achieved, now we're talking about SDGs. If we can get your thoughts about, you know, we're talking about corruption and accountability and transparency, I mean, these are all really important things, but in my experience for all these years, the real challenge is just getting ministries to be able to figure out how much things are going to cost. Um, so if we can get some ideas from you, some thoughts on that, that'd be great, thank you. Well, I, I don't have an answer, and not nearly as wonkish as uh, your question, but, um, and this, this kind of puts a finer point on what Casey was saying in terms of the high-level political forum, but about the general project of follow-up and review. 
which is something that we've been emphasizing a lot, and so have many others in the private sector, civil society. This is a big thing that World Vision for One talks a lot about, and the Partnering Initiative and others, which is I would be very happy if all of those 22 countries in, in this July, which, you know, it's not fair in a way that it's July, and we only created this in September, but, it, you know, it was scheduled, so they're going to have to show up and say something. But I would be really impressed if they don't talk about outcomes at all, obviously, but process. And something that a lot of the actors that, that I mentioned and ourselves included have been pushing for is how do you convene or what's the best way to convene a multi-stakeholder national conversation about your SDG priorities? Because going back to some of my other you know, comments, let's be realistic. They can't get to them all. They're not going to get to them all. So let them pick their priorities. Let them identify with multi-stakeholder, you know, others in the room, civil society with business operating there locally or maybe also multinationals who might be in the, in the market or looking to enter the market. Where are you doing well? Where would you like to do better? Where have you made some gains and want to double down? Where have you been neglecting? And then get the people in the room to have that conversation. Now, I know that is far more, you know, complicated and harder to do than, than to say, but I think that from the standpoint, and this also gets to the governance issue, if you can at least begin to have those conversations in a real way, in a transparent way, then even if you don't get across the goal line 15 years from now, you're gonna have made a lot of people happy that they were involved and you asked them for their role. And at least from the private sector's perspective, we feel too often that we're just invited in at the end to provide the paycheck or to do some you know, basic additional capacity implementation work, but never really invited in from the beginning uh, to help plan and conceive, to tell the minister, no, 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 that idea makes no sense. You're using old technology, or you haven't thought about how it's going to impact this or that. A great example of this is Bechtel's work in Gabon. Their plan, they were invited in by the ministry there to plan a multi, I don't even know, um, billion dollar national infrastructure project, which is going to be trans-regional and involve lots of different lines of infrastructure. They're seconding or basically, you know, creating this national development ministry and eventually training others to, so that they're no longer employed there. But I mean, that's a really interesting model to actually invite the private sector in from the beginning. And it shouldn't just be the private sector. Civil society should be there to make sure things are being done well, that you're not spending over cost. Um, and that citizens' voices are heard in the process. But I mean, at least, I think, get the process right um, so that people feel included. Can I? Oh. Sure, go ahead. Just, um, I wanted to offer two quick points on that because it's an excellent um, question and gets to kind of the crux of the issue. Um, I was, I just got back from Kosovo and was in a meeting with the government and they had just, as of January, um, um, finalized their national um, development strategy. There were 34 specific objectives and, and priorities, and I asked if, if they had thought about kind of the SDGs in, in formulating it, and they had and had mapped the, the 34 objectives to the SDGs, and the plan focused on seven goals. And the gentleman was like, oh, it's only seven. And I was like, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. You have um, a plan, and a process and they're working on how to actually cost it now and I was like this is exactly the way it should work because as Ariel mentioned it's it's going to be a menu of options it's 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 going to have to be and the second point I would also um, actually about two more points um, on the the PFM side of it I think uh, in referencing the domestic resource mobilization and the huge sums that are mobilized we're going to have to do a far better job of on the expenditure side of the coin, and that's where transparency and 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 having um, fiduciary systems that are transparent and open to citizens is going to be so critical because these sums are only going to increase. Third point on the output outcome side, there has been so much invested in, um, and here I'm 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 speaking of um, USAID and this push for local ownership and and local solutions, and there's been a huge push. Um, but the only metric right now we have on it is input. How many dollars are going directly to a local entity? It tells us nothing. It could be a, um, a bad modality. You could get a, a better 
outcome using um, Nathan Associates, we just don't know. And so we're trying to develop output metrics around what sustainability means and what local ownership means. And, and it's, it's the capacity building. It's if, if the results are still there five years later. And so I think to add more to kind of the data requirement side of it, we need far better metrics around sustainability and outcomes because right now it's, it's, it's still um, on the input side of it and that tells us nothing. Okay, okay. let's go to the next question over here. Oh, good morning. My name is Kirby Bryan, recent graduate from George Mason uh, Policy School. Um, Augusto, or Mr. Lopez Claros, you mentioned uh, the austerity of the extreme poverty line and alluded to the sort of fluidity of the definition thereof. Um, and given the relativity, the relativity of the extreme poverty line and the threat of inflationary forces, uh, is it even rationally possible to eradicate, do you see it as even possible to eradicate ex so-called extreme poverty? Uh, or do you, or does this SDG run the risk of becoming a solution looking for a problem? Um, I guess the point I was trying to make by referring to the austerity of the poverty line is that um, we may have set up a goal, and this is my private opinion, please, let me make clear that I'm not on this particular next couple of sentences, I'm not wearing my World Bank hat. I'm just giving you my own professional assessment. It seems to me that our goal uh, is actually not ambitious enough. I don't think SDG number one is ambitious enough. Uh, I think that there is li high likelihood that well before 2030, um, at least under current methodologies, which have been broadly endo endorsed by, by the international community, we will actually reach um, SDG number one, maybe not now down to zero, right? At least at the World Bank, we have we have said that by 2030 we want to reduce the incidence of extreme poverty to three percent, right? Um, and I think this is very much linked to the fact that our definition of extreme poverty is a very tough definition. I think that if we had adopted a somewhat more generous definition of what it means to be poor. I don't know, a $3 poverty line or you know, slightly higher, then we would have more poor people according to that definition and therefore we would, we would be you know, more challenged to, you know, to get these people out of poverty by 2030. I think that's the, 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 the issue. That's, that's the, uh, the, the problem as I see it. That, that methodologically speaking, we have hundreds of millions of people who are just on the other side of the $1.90 poverty line. Here, I think I saw a question. Hi, thanks. Kira Kaczynski from Deloitte. Uh, and I have a sort of a two part question. I think what I think is really interesting about the 17 SDGs is that they really get to a lot of root causes of poverty that the, that the original MDGs did not. So um, two parts there for Augusto. For you, you, you mentioned that you're looking at a lot of um, gender and economics. Uh, which I think is is really critical. But then later we t also talked about the importance of rule of law and anti-corruption. So I'm curious as to whether you or you're aware of any other research that are particularly looking at the disproportionate effect of it, corruption on women. I think that's a really interesting topic, not whether or not women are more corrupt, but the effect that corruption has on women. I think that's a, that's a different thing and not really relevant. Um, and in that kind of research, what I see is the coming together of a couple of ND, uh, sustainable development goals, right? I think that when you see a country picking just seven, um, that's great, and you know, because they can't do them all. However, there seems to be a lot of natural integration. For example, a gender lens on anti-corruption, and it's a way to target a couple things at once. Um, so sort of a two-part question there. Any research that you've seen in that area, and then also other areas where the panel might see natural coming together of certain SDGs. I mean, you could see it in health and environment or, or other spaces. Thanks. Um, very interesting question. Um, it's interesting. Uh, actually, um, if you look at the criminality data, uh, there are a number of studies. One that I am familiar with is from the, uh, from the, um, um, I'm trying to remember the source. I think the U.S. Academy of Sciences, actually. 
that basically shows that uh, the overwhelming majority of people who are locked up in jails, either in the US or in other countries, are men. Right? That, that is just a, a fact, it's a fact. There was a very interesting study done in the United Kingdom last year, in the early part of 2015, looking at 6,500 6, companies. And one of the issues that they looked at is, you know, what is the participation of women on the board of the company? And a very, very clear conclusion that comes out of that study is that those, those companies that have higher participation of women on the board are actually much less prone to to fraud, to in corporate governance scandals, and all kinds of other things which essentially give a bad name to the company and create a kind of an uncertain uh, investment environment. So um, one of the things that we're, we're actively working on in, in the Women Business on the Law project, which compiles this data on restrictions, is looking at the experience in countries that have actually introduced quotas for the participation of women, especially in uh, sort of uh, parliaments, you know, village councils, that have con that have con sort of introduced quotas as a, as a means of empowering women, and the data that is coming out of that is really really fascinating, um, and bears very much on the nature of your question. Uh, for instance, those countries that have. Um, uh, quotas for participation of women in parliament have higher labor force participation rates for women on average, right? So already, you know, you see a linkage to prosperity and, and poverty reduction, because obviously the more women you have in the work in, 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 in the labor force, the higher the family income and, and so on. You know, the connections are quite obvious there. Um, we are discovering that those countries that have uh, quotas that empower women politically tend to be much better able to utilize resources in an effective way. Um, you know, we're talking now about where is the money going to come from? Right? Well, hopefully some of that money is going to come from a more effective use of public resources, right? Not only less money to energy subsidies, but also, you know, more money is better spent, better targeted, you know, to th do, doing things like, for instance, developing uh, you know, the capacities for data collection and, and, and monitoring. Uh, it's interesting to see that in those countries where women are politically empowered through quotas, um, uh, resource utilization is much better, uh, there is more, um, better, better quality investments, more savings, and, and so on. So, so the empowerment of women is very, very much linked to the question that you raise about, you know, reducing, reducing uh, corruption. Um, in, 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 our, in our countries. Isn't it also again, I mean, I don't know the research off the top of my head, but isn't there research on down to the household level in terms of women being better economic stewards and savers? Oh, completely. So that's yeah. reinvestment, you know, creation of local jobs and just having more money, which means you can send your kids to school or save up to have your own business or give someone else a loan, so and you know, that's a productive use of capital. So. I think that it does make a lot of sense um, at, down to that level as well. Yeah, Not just, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you, they happen to have the good fortune of getting into elected office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the reasons why increasing the participation of women in the labor force is tremendously important uh, is because it shifts the balance of power within the household. When the woman works, when she's contributing income to family income, she has more power. She has more say on how the resources are, are spent. And as, as you point out, Ariel, uh, when that happens, the evidence is overwhelming that resources are better spent. There is better, better savings behavior, more, 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 more investing in education and training and public and health of children and so on. So, so there are all kinds of positive collateral benefits associated with the empowerment of women politically and economically. Yeah, I, that's an excellent point because actually the panel is not just about the SDGs, it is about sustainable development and you can't have that conversation without talking about women's role in the economy. <clears throat> um, we had a question in the front. So, uh, the Do you want to use the microphone? microphone. Uh, the way I understood the process of developing the SDGs was a very global process. Uh, kind of a buy-in from various governments and you know, the stakeholders especially, um, you know, probably changing the power balance that we are seeing through South to South collaboration or other stuff. What is the gravity, gravity of this whole process to stay together 
And, and what do you see as the, as the pull and push coming from international community on more like developing countries in Asia and Africa and, and South America? Perhaps, yeah, I'll start. Um, that's a, a fantastic um, question. This, the, the creation of this agenda was the most inclusive kind of process I would argue that the UN has ever conducted, especially in comparison to the MDGs, which were um, um, created kind of in a, a dark basement in um, some corner of Turtle Bay. But the, the, the blessing of, of this level of inclusivity is also a little bit a curse in that you got a highly expansive um, agenda because you had so many uh, key um, stakeholders at the table. I also think that there was a huge um, push to establish the goals and targets. And after the UN summit, everyone patted themselves on the backs and there were um, concerts. I think um, there was a huge one in, in, in um, Central Park. The Pope spoke. It was, it was um, quite impressive. And now it's time to implement and everyone's gone a, a bit quiet because the roadmap is um, far from certain. Everyone knew what they were working towards to have the 17 goals and then have the 169 targets to undergird them. And now that it's time to implement this huge agenda, everyone's a little bit scratching their heads. And I think a part of that is also because the clear role for civil society and private sector and all these new stakeholders who were at the table to develop the goals, their role in implementation is kind of up in the air. And so I think and hopefully in July at this forum, there will be a specific emphasis on how in terms of implementation, because it's not only governments obviously, how these key stakeholders who are at the table to develop the goals will actually have a specific role in implementing them, which I think is gonna be um, a make or break part of the, of, of the SDGs. Casey, how, how do you, who's gonna push that? How, how is that gonna happen? I, um, that's an excellent question, I don't know, because you would expect the locust to come from the UN, but right now the, the concern is kind of who, who will be the next president and, um, or um, secretary um, general, and so there's not much kind of organizing capacity because it really is, as boring as it is, it's about the process, as, as has been mentioned um, on the panel, and right now there's no kind of leading push to actually get this thing going. Um, it will have to come from the UN, at least as kind of the the genesis, um, but I, I don't think we're seeing that yet. There are there other thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, this is something that we push on actually quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> in terms of your question about power dynamics, in addition to shifts between member states, the other aspect of that is member states becoming more comfortable with listening to other stakeholders who are non-state actors. And that's a big struggle, particularly once you're in the UN. Um, and you know, we have this structure, which is a holdover from uh, Agenda 21, which has major groups and other stakeholders. And business is one of business and industry is one of those, and they're all you know very important. But when you look at the inclusivity of the 2030 agenda and the language which is used there, which if you compare it to Millennium Development Goals, is much more obviously, um, much more obviously acknowledges the role of the private sector in being a partner in this process. And as Casey was pointing out in terms of the resource flows, it's obvious where the money is coming from and where it needs to come from. In partnership with government and setting the right policies, but if you look at then the distribution of major groups and, and other stakeholders, business is one of several. And the way things are organized at the UN, business has to get together in a room, and I'm being, this is completely what has to happen not what has to happen, this is the way it's structured. Business gets into a room with all these other stakeholders, whether it's um, labor or teachers or scientists, um, et cetera, elderly. Again, very youth, didn't mean to leave them out. Extremely important stakeholders, everyone needs to be heard from. But then that group is tasked with selecting a selection committee who then picks speakers and the speakers and everyone has to come up with consensus statements. Well, there's some groups in that room who are openly hostile to business and don't think business should be part of the conversation shouldn't even be there because they believe that the UN is already subject to a corporate capture, which I can tell you from spending some time there is very far from the case. So in terms of process, one of the things that we've been pushing along with the global, the, it's called the Global Business Alliance for 2030, 
is to have a separate track for business. So business can organize itself, it can pick its speakers, it can have time on the floor, it can provide its solutions, its ideas, along with member states and others, but in a proportionate way to the, to the role it's being asked to play. And this actually works in some corners of the, the global system. Um, the Committee on Food Security has a private sector mechanism. The Financing for Development Conference had a separate track for business and a separate track for civil society. Um, it just is, a, we think, a better way of, of, of getting the right output from the private sector. It allows them to feel part of the, more part of the conversation. It enables you to get the high-level C-suite executives that the UN member states so desperately want to come to the UN because we can tell them, you will get a spot to speak, you can be part of the conversation, whereas right now, we're waiting to the last minute, two days before an event, to say, yes, CEO of a Fortune 100 company, you're allowed to come. So that's a major change that still needs to happen, and it's something we've been pushing for, and maybe we'll see it. And I'm and, and happy to say at the high-level political forum in July, we do have a SDG business forum, which unlike last year, will actually be in the UN itself. So if you happen to be there, uh, you can participate and hear, hear what business has to say. Well, and we saw it this morning in the keynote address by Mr. Agutu, who talked about how his company has integrated three of the SDGs into some of their business planning. So I think there is evidence that that's happening, on the, that the private sector has that interest, and maybe they'll get the opportunity to, to have that voice. Like well, the said. struggle right now is there's some darlings, yeah. the UN likes certain companies and, and wants to hear from them, but it's the same. If you go back and look at all the agendas over the last several years, you're going to start seeing the same names pop up again and again. <laughs> If we really want to see this achieved globally, all the way down to SMEs, which make up the vast majority of businesses all around the world, you need to find a way to communicate and involve others. Yeah, excellent. There's a question over here. David Hughes with Mendes England and Associates. I'd like to come back to the jobs issue, and I think, Augusto, I agree with you that we can achieve you know, the, the numbers. My, my concern, though, is on the quality of the jobs that we are creating. Because, yes, we can get people out from extreme poverty to just above that poverty level. But if we don't create good jobs, then how are we going to sustain those people in the longer term? And the other, so, so I think I, my question is, do we have any data on how much it costs to create good quality jobs? And then my second point is related to what are we doing to employ the large number of unemployed graduates coming out of universities within, I, I know it from sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm sure it's in, in the rest of the developing world too, because that is a human, that's human capital that is going to waste in how we move this whole process forward. Um, there is kind of a hierarchy of concerns when it comes to you know, job creation and, and employment. And typically in organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, um, the first thing that we think of when we think about the needs for job creation is economic growth. You know, very, you know, there is a very high correlation between um, a country's ability to create a policy environment that supports economic growth and then, you know, what happens to unemployment rates. Um, beyond that, obviously, comes the issue of, you know, what kinds of jobs are, are, are we creating? Uh, um, do they provide uh, meaning and satisfaction to the people who have them? And here, other factors come into play. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the whole question of education and training, you know. Um, do people have the right kinds of skills, you know, that we need for the, for the 21st century? And I think that uh, the SDG on education actually addresses some of, some of, these, some of these questions. Uh, just to, to, to give you an example, I'm going to pick up the, the language that they use, since I happen to have it here. Um, they put a special focus on education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, right? Um, that which I think when you think of sustainable lifestyles, that is directly addressing the question of well-being, satisfaction, you know, presumably good quality jobs. 
Um, you know, this is a very, very large subject. Um, my own sense is that the SDGs are, I think, rightly focused on, you know, the really urgent stuff, the stuff that needs to be done in the first instance. And there, um, you know, poverty reduction, uh, promoting gender equality, addressing shortcomings on health and so on are, are the most important. I think that within that framework, if there are things that we can do in terms of creating you know, higher quality jobs and so on, that is uh, tremendously important as well, but I don't think it is going to be a kind of a primary concern of the SDGs. Can I just add one thing? Um, because you mentioned kind of the quality aspect, and I do think uh, a, uh, one of the, the benefits of the SDGs vis-a-vis -vis the MDGs is this focus on quality. So with education, the MDGs were about um, getting kids in school and then there was kind of no measurement. And so now it's about measuring um, um, literacy and, and numeracy. And so there is much more of an, an emphasis on uh, the qualitative aspect over the quantitative. And I think that uh, notion is directly um, related to kind of the sustainability aspect of the goals and this notion that we need to be thinking more long-term and, and ensure that the things that we're doing are not simply ticking the box, but actually having kind of a meaningful effect. And that was, from the beginning, a, a big uh, um, push of the SDGs. I would just add one last thing, which is that there is a quality aspect in goal eight, um, target 8.7. I believe, which has to do with the eradication of forced labor, human trafficking, child labor. So when you're talking about bringing people into, out of the informal economy where there's far greater prevalence of those kinds of um, jobs um, into more formal employment where there's much lower prevalence of it, then that's part of it as well. You know, It's not great to be talking about a quality job as well, it's not slavery, but like Augusta was saying, you know, we do have a long way to go, uh, even by that measure, and so, you know, we are focused on that as well, and it is something that people are focused on, um, both at the high level education aspect, you know, the private sector does a lot on STEM and other things, and we've been part of initiatives which have created um, apprenticeship networks which are growing up all over the world. The U.S. government just announced over 170, I think, million towards apprenticeships here in the United States, and that might focus more on slightly high level, high level jobs, um, but it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a first step. Actually, uh, Ariel's comment reminds me that in the doing business data that we have for 189 countries, there is a very clear linkage between your doing business scores uh, and levels of informality. The, the sounder the f regulatory framework that you create that encourages entrepreneurship and that um, you know, creates a, a kind of a friendly environment for the private sector, the lower the levels of informality. And obviously, informality is very much linked to job quality. So there you, there you have an, something else that, you know, that, that countries, can, countries are, 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 can, can focus on. We're reaching the limit of our time. We have time for one more question, if anybody has it. And, and if not, I'll exercise the privilege of mon Oh, sorry, there is one. Hi, uh, I'm Shuchi Aranika. I'm from University of Michigan. I'm a recent graduate as well from uh, School of Public Policy. Um, I just wanted to know um, what are the kind of lessons we've learned from MDGs that were, and how are we going to implement them on, on SDGs and uh, so that it doesn't become just a checklist of achieving goals and becoming sustainable solutions to some of the world problems? So if you could tell us something more about uh, it. I think we, and Casey already said this, but we already learned one thing, which was to have a more inclusive process. And so, for better or for worse, the, the, the drafting and the creation of the SDGs was far more inclusive. Um, and there is a, a very um, strong, focused conversation about national ownership, which I, I guess I don't know if I was paying attention as closely during the MDGs, whether that, that was there as well. So I think those are positive elements that you could maybe call lessons learned. With consequences, you know, who knows? I would, uh, and here I'm going to be a little bit cynical again. Um, so I, if if we kind of look at uh, attributable results to the MDGs, I'm not sure that you could um, say any kind of development activities are directly attributable to the MDGs. What you can say is that it was 
an exercise in, in branding and focusing the world. And I think it was hugely s successful in doing that, not only at the national level, but also the, um, the Global Fund and Gavi and, and all these new mechanisms that were um, created to, to directly focus on goals. Because the MDGs were so targeted and specific, the branding exercise worked. The SDGs are so big and expansive, I fear that the same kind of um, uh, uh, cohesive br um, branding and, and push is simply not um, going to be possible. And so here I would say we didn't really learn the lesson from the MDGs of, of, of the value that they, they brought to this whole development enterprise. And in having such an expansive SDG agenda, we're gonna lose that specific um, focusing and, and branding power for the world. Yeah, well, it's always great to end a panel with lessons <laughs> learned, uh, cynical or not. Uh, be, but we, before we finish, I do want to acknowledge uh, two people, uh, Jack Andre and Matt Yarrington, two of my colleagues and Nathan Associates that helped organize this panel. And uh, let's thank our speakers. <laughs>